now, doom and gloom is here, but it's not all there is in the world, I promise. In fact, this morning, we have good news too. Three, two, one. And lift off of Artemis One. You could be living on the moon before too long. NASA tells us this morning, we'll be there before the end of the decade. We're gonna be sending people down to the surface and they're gonna be living on that surface. You wouldn't be blamed for wanting to get away. We will face into the storm. There may be a recession made in Russia, but there is a recovery made in Britain. Metaphors won't make what's coming hurt your pocket any less. When the global storm hits, we are uniquely exposed because of the choices that the Conservatives have made. Now the government's given us its plans for counting the pennies. We have one big question this morning. How much is it really going to hurt? With less cash about, what does that mean for the biggest public service, the NHS? We'll talk to the man in charge at Health, Steve Barclay. And what's the alternative to the government's plan? We'll hear from Labour's John Ashworth. Rise together, back to the moon and beyond. And we will lift our eyes over the horizon. Artemis One is successfully up in space. We'll talk to NASA's Howard Hugh about the start of man's journey to live on the moon before the end of the decade. And with me at the desk, Tony Danker, the man who speaks for British business, the boss of the CBI. Gary Smith, the chief of the GMB union, who represents half a million workers. And with the game about to kick off in Qatar, footballer Chloe Morgan is here too. There's a lot to come. Football, finance, and maybe a bit of fun between now and 10. Very good morning. There's a lot to get into in the next hour, but we're going to start with news coming out of Egypt this morning. A climate deal has been reached at the COP summit that we talked a lot about on the show a couple of weeks ago. But does it really stack up? Well, our climate editor, Justin Rollat, is there for us this morning. Justin, what's been agreed and does it stack up? It's a it's a complex agreement. It was agreed here just a few hours ago. I'm on the stage here. You can see they're clearing everything away around me. The key thing that was agreed was this fund for loss and damage. The loss and damage climate change is already causing vulnerable nations. Now, that is something that has rankled developing countries since the beginning of these climate talks. 30 years ago, back in 1992, they've been saying, listen, guys, you have to address this issue to the developed world. The developed world has consistently said, we're not interested in talking about that. We'll talk about emissions cuts. We'll talk about adaptation. We do not want to sign up for the costs that climate change is going to cause you in the future. So getting it onto the agenda here was itself a big deal. And to be honest, coming down here, we didn't think that the B success. I remember stopping Jen, uh, John Kerry, the US climate envoy, saying to him, what do you think of this plan for a fund? He said, basically, that is not going to happen. So, I mean, it is an incredible success that the Egyptians have brought home this fund. I mean, I've spoken to Sherry Rehman. She's the climate minister for Pakistan. She negotiated on behalf of the developing nations. I can't tell you she is delighted. You know, she's so pleased with what she achieved. She says it's the beginning of a long process. There's no money in the fund, for example. But she says, you know, this is the beginning of climate justice, a recognition. A com I mean, they try and avoid these words, <laughs> compensation, reparation. But obviously, if you're a developing nation, a vulnerable nation, you see it as compensation and reparation for the fact that the developed world got rich, burning fossil fuels and caused the problem. So in that sense, that is really significant and it cannot be underestimated. But at the same time, the language on cutting emissions is really disappointing. It almost, in parts, mirrors word. It's like they've cut and pasted the Glasgow Agreement from last year, put it in their document, and then actually dialed it back a bit. So there's talk about low emissions energy sources, and I've been asking everyone here what that is. I, the Danish, the, sorry, the Norwegian uh, Environment Minister accepted that it could include gas. So this is an agreement that could allow natural gas, obviously a fossil fuel, to be part of a green solution, which I have to say does sound crazy. And we spoke to, obviously, Alok Sharma, president of COP. He oversaw Glasgow. 
really disappointed with ambition in this. He said, look, the point of these conferences is to dial up ambition, increase uh, our effort to cut emissions. That is just not happening post here. So in a sense, I think the Egyptians had a real opportunity to create a triumph and they've snatched a defeat from it by not just increasing the ambition on cutting emissions and adaptation. Justin, thanks so much. Lots to unpick there, and we'll come to more of that later in the programme. But let's take a look at today's front pages here in the UK. You can see the BBC story with news of that climate deal Justin was talking about. There at the front of the Sunday Times, Britain mulling Swiss-style ties with Brussels, which would drive Brexiteers crazy. Um, you can see there on the front page of the Sunday Express talking about the FIFA boss's controversial remarks at the opening ceremony of the World Cup. We'll talk about that a bit more later too. But firstly, Gary, your union is talking about possible strikes when it comes to health workers. We're going to talk to the health secretary, Steve Barclay, in just a second. But what's going on? Why? You speak to our ambulance me members. These are people who worked through the pandemic without adequate PPE. People who were applauded through the pandemic. They should have been emerging into a different world where they were properly rewarded and resourced. And that hasn't happened. One in three ambulance workers tells us that they think delays due to cuts in services have led to deaths. People are fed up, their pay has been going backwards over the years, the service has been cut to bits. Uh, and I would invite the health secretary to come, in ambulance, to come and meet our ambulance members and see what's actually happening at the front line of the service. Well, let's see what he says about that in a few minutes' time. Um, Tony, that front page story on the Sunday Times about the government maybe thinking, after all, they quite fancy having closer ties with the EU, maybe a bit like Switzerland, which critically is not in the EU, but they do have access to the market no. through other ways. Do you think there's anything in that or is this hell round? Well, look, I think, as we saw on Thursday, there's not a lot of great growth prospects for the country and the government can't afford to pump prime the economy like they used to. So it's no surprise that we're starting to look to other ways to grow the economy that don't cost money. And one obvious place is can we improve trade with Europe? The problem is we're not currently even implementing Boris's deal. So I don't think we need to talk about Switzerland. We need to first talk about can we implement the Boris deal, which has more opportunity we're not capturing because of the Northern Ireland Protocol. So rather than talking about Switzerland, I think the government need to talk about Northern Ireland, improve trade with Europe. That will help us grow. And that stuff, maybe we can come back to that in another, in another decade. But I think we need to solve the Northern Ireland problem first. So not for 10 years, get on with the job at yeah. hand. Now, Chloe, we've all been reading and watching about the World Cup. Its location in Qatar has made this a very controversial tournament. You know, there have been some fireworks and some celebration. But do you feel, I suppose, conflicted about it? What do you think? I think it's, um, it's massively a, a moral and ethical dilemma, I think, for a lot of fans, uh, a lot of supporters, the players themselves. Um, it's something that everyone has a very strong view on, and it's really hard to be excited about a tournament where there are so many things going on behind the scenes, like you said, so much controversy. And I think it puts you in a difficult position because I think for a lot of people, they want to be able to you know, enjoy the World Cup, get behind it. It's something that's supposed to unify people and you know, make people excited about you know, getting to see nations play and you know, the prospects of their own nation winning. But for this tournament, it just feels like it's a little bit damp and you can understand why, because there's just so much... Um, you know, controversy around what's happened. And we'll talk a bit more about that later, including what the FIFA boss had to say yesterday, which raised a lot of eyebrows. Now, we heard it here in this studio last week, didn't we? And it came to pass. The Chancellor confirmed hard times ahead. More tax and less cash for public services in the years to come. There was a little extra money, though, for the biggest service, the NHS, but there aren't enough staff. Waits are longer every day and we all know that a lack of care for the elderly is making things worse. And thousands stuck in NHS beds because there isn't enough help on the other side. Wasn't there the odd promise or two in the years gone by to sort that out? There are catastrophic, catastrophic costs that lead them to have to sell their homes to pay for that care. Mm. It's right to try and put in place a cap. For once, you know, after all the discussion there's been over very many years, this really is going to be something that's going to happen the first ever proper plan to pay for and provide social care. And so I am announcing now on the steps of Downing Street that we will fix the crisis in social care once and for all with a clear plan we have prepared. Now, Steve Barclay, the Health Secretary, is here. Welcome to the studio. Um, have you given up on fixing social care? No, it's a very difficult decision to delay those reforms. We remain committed to them. 
but we recognise there's an immediate issue, particularly in hospitals where we've got 13,500 people who are ready to discharge but were not able to do so. That is having a knock-on effect in areas like ambulances and the flow through hospital. And the prime cause of that, not the only cause, but the prime cause of that is around social care. So it's right that we're targeting investment, 2.8 billion next year, 4.7 billion the year after. Part of that clear commitment from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to invest in health and care, 8 billion going into 2024. So we're prioritising the funding we need to get that flow into the hospitals and key amongst that is getting more funding into social care. But you're not actually making changes to the system that your own government, your own party has agreed for years have to happen because or else you're just, you know, you're pouring water into a bucket that's got a hole at the bottom. Well, the change we're making is committing to a further 200,000 care packages over the next two years. And that's material both within care itself but also into the hospitals, because the key challenge we're facing, which is then being reflected in the challenge in A&E, in the challenge in, uh, access, uh, in ambulances, so is getting people out of hospital. It's having, and it's not happening right now. I want to read you an email from one of our viewers who's a senior NHS employee. They've said, if you said to me you can have an extra billion for the NHS, you have to instead give it to social care. They write, this logjam is killing us and literally killing people. How can you justify delaying the change that's required again? Well, the issue that they're highlighting there, the, the impact on the health of it, is exactly the, the thing we're targeting. That is why we're putting the money into social care, £8 billion in 2024 into health and social care to address the fact that what happens in care has a direct impact on what is happening but your in colleagues, our ambulances. Your predecessors and your colleagues, people still in charge right now, have acknowledged it's not just about putting extra money in. For years there's been agreement, there has to be change to the system. I ask you mm. again, how can you delay justify how can you justify delaying the change? Again. Well, the local government um, bodies have themselves uh, asked us to delay because obviously they were concerned about such a major change at a time when, as a consequence of the pandemic, uh, the market is under such pressure within the care but sector. But why should our but viewers believe really you're matters? ever going to do it? Because this is, there's been delay after delay after delay after delay. Everybody agrees it's important and it never happened. Why should people watching this morning believe that you are ever going to change the system? Because I think your viewers can re respect the fact that with the pandemic, with the pressure that we have in our hospitals, let me give you one example of just why there has been such a change of circumstances. Going into the pandemic, we had 1,300 people waiting more than 52 weeks for an operation. That, uh, as of today, is over 400,000. So these challenges are due to the pressure that we face from the pandemic. But they're That's not why all about we've had to take the difficult decision. And it is a difficult decision. The Chancellor himself, when doing my job as Health Secretary, was very committed to these reforms. And that's why it has been a difficult decision to delay. Mm. But what we recognise is we need more care packages in social care. It's right to buy those 200,000 additional places over the next two years. But also but the spending in social care and by delaying these reforms enables us to fix the real challenges we're seeing in our A&E departments mm -hmm. and in our ambulance And, and we'll come to that in just a second. But Secretary of State, I want also to pick you up on something there. You said the problems are down to the pandemic. In fact, these problems were building before we got into the pandemic. In February 2020, there were already four and a half million people on a waiting list for care. The cancer target got worse between 2013 and 2018. These problems were already being stored up. You can't just blame the pandemic, can you? Well, I'm saying predominantly the issue of the challenge, and I was giving an example of that. If I take ambulances, uh, the delays on uh, the target that's usually looked at, the CAT2 target, was a third uh, before the pandemic to where it is now. So, of course, there were challenges going into the pandemic. That's why uh, we're targeted through the long-term plan significant additional investment into healthcare. But it is the case that the, the very real challenges that we all recognise the health service faces, particularly around ambulance delays, our a &E departments and people who are ready to discharge from hospital, those 13,500 patients, where it's in their interest from a care point of view to get them out of hospital, but it's also interested in getting flow into the system. And that's why it's right to prioritise that within the very significant funding and we'll come to your priorities in a second, but I know you use the word challenge a lot. 
I want to show our viewers what challenge really means. We can look at this graph. You might want to look at it as well. The number of patients who have to wait over 12 hours before getting onto a ward when they arrive at A&E. Look at that spike. And in a way, Laura, That's that makes... That's a challenge. That's a disaster, That makes isn't my it? exact point. You can see the extent to which that has risen uh, exponentially since your watch. the pandemic. So the point is, the point I was making was in terms of where from the Labour Party who hear this being a 12-year issue, you can see there's been a very material impact from the pandemic. And it's in that context that we've taken the difficult decision on social care, whilst we remain committed to those reforms, to delay them for two years, which frees up the £6.6 .6 billion pound you, investment into our NHS, but also the £2.8 and £4.7 billion that goes you, into But care. can you look at that as Health Secretary and tell our viewers this morning that this system is working? Well, that's why we're put. We're can, the very that's difficult... My question. Can you tell people that well, the NHS the reason is working it is right under, now? I recognise, Laura, that it is under severe pressure, uh, and that graph illustrates that. That is why, despite the very real challenges in the autumn statement that the Chancellor faced, he prioritised funding for health, an extra £6.6 .6 billion over the next two less years. Than the they asked for. Well, the less than they say the they NHS, need. Well, the Chief Executive of the NHS was clear this gives the NHS the funding that it needs. Uh, but we have also, alongside that, recognised that simply focusing on the NHS without also focusing on care mm -hmm. will not actually address the issue of delayed discharge. Which is why some people wonder why you're delaying the reform, but we've, we've, we've talked about that. Do you accept that in the real world, though, the consequences for people here are sometimes truly awful? Now, Georgina Lee, who's the Chief Executive of a trust in Gloucestershire, she said this week on the record that people have died while they're waiting for ambulances. Is she wrong? Well, it's absolutely, there's, the, there's concerns the coroner, likewise in Cornwall, has raised concerns with me that I am looking at extremely And are closely. they wrong that people in this country in 2022 are dying unnecessarily because of blockages in the NHS? Well, if there is a delay in an ambulance getting to someone in terms of that unmet need, then obviously that is a material risk. And that is why it is so important that we get the flow in terms of those handover delays. That in turn is often uh, about a fifth of the delay is mm -hmm. due to what happens in hospitals itself. But, but the primary cause of the delay, the biggest factor, has been delays in domiciliary care and residential homes. That's why we've put in place a mm -hmm. significant programme of work. We've had a task force looking at the delayed discharge. Uh, we've got uh, additional funding going into that. But, but we've but got to get the flow through. Otherwise, that is what is causing the delays in But on that specific question, though, Steve Barkley, you've got you know, serious people, an NHS boss and a coroner from part of the country saying in the last couple of days that people are dying unnecessarily because of blockages in the health service. Do well, what you we've got to do, well, what we have level to do, with people? Well, what we have to do is ensure we address that handover delay. There's a range of factors within that. We need to look at demand management within our care homes uh, and how we're getting the support there. We need to look at pre-cohorting. We need to look at different conveyance rates, uh, address some of the variation in performance between mm. different areas. Uh, around a, th a third uh, of the problem in terms of handover delays is concentrated in around 12 trusts so we've got targeted measures mm. particularly focused at that but a lot of people, uh, and we've got additional funding going in but you, a lot of people believe though that actually it's years of underfunding that have led to the service being in the state that it is irrespective of the pandemic that this problem has been building for a long time we, long time we heard from gary smith the gmb union boss there but I, I don't and the, accept that you, you don't you accept look, that no i don't because if you look we've now got 50 percent more consultants mm -hmm. since 2010 we've got 40 percent more ambulance staff than we did have 2010. When the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, was doing my job and I was uh, Minister of State in the department four years ago, mm -hmm. we put in place the biggest increase uh, in doctor training, 25%, uh, five new medical schools. But Steve Barclay, it is true that compared to other comparable countries, we spend less per head, I think nearly 20% per head less than other comparable European countries. Well, I think you can see over the years, whether it was during the coalition years, David Cameron protected health more than other departments. Uh, Theresa May invested in the long-term plan. Boris Johnson had the biggest hospital building programme, 40 new hospitals, a very significant capital uplift because the estate also matters. And what we've seen from this Prime Minister and Chancellor is the NHS and care prioritised at a very difficult time for public finances. And that is why we've got eight billion going into 2024, uh, reflecting that uplift. Maybe though, actually, 
what we need to do as a country is have an honest conversation about doing less. Now you've talked about priorities. Yep. That means choosing, doesn't it? Should the NHS do less? You've written this morning in the mail about programmes that are far removed from the priorities of patients. So what should it not do? Uh, well, I think firstly we've got um, 2.8 billion of cost in the department I and mean, its on-length bodies at the sector. Uh, that's over 50,000. Mm -hmm. That's over 50,000 uh, people. They're not in directly patient-facing roles. I think there's opportunities in terms of merging those, but also having fewer targets, devolving more decision-making to trust uh, and integrated care boards. One so of what the opportunities. Would you drop then? Well, one of the opportunities. Well, it's about devolving more decision-making so that it can be taken on a population basis. Uh, we have the federated data platform, which will give IT uh, allow us to look on a population at a local level at what are the specific needs. So and does the point that mean is, that individual trusts might be able to decide to it's about stop giving doing them more, some things? It's about giving them more discretion. When I talk to trust leaders, one of their frustrations is just the sheer amount of time they spend managing upwards. Mm -hmm. uh, if I give an example from another area, when I was in the Cabinet Office, I discovered that we had over 50 strategies for science and technology. Uh, and I think 2.8 billion on the centre, the scope to look at that, to look at how we bring that cost down, uh, to empower more and to use our integrated care boards more to look at where risk sits. So to go but to what your... about the services that people get though? So if there's more decision making locally, does that mean that people in parts, different parts of the country might get different services? No, it's about looking at having more efficient pathways. So let me give you an example on cancer. Uh, at, at previously from a GP, there was a requirement to send to a specialist. We've now just announced direct access to look at a more streamlined pathway so you don't have the same level of bottleneck. We can have more home testing and go straight to diagnostic centres. We've got 91 diagnostic centres open. We've got a programme on surgical hubs. So it's about looking at a local level, how we design our healthcare system in a way that more empowers local leaders, better uses the population level data that we will have through the federated data platform and having less diktat from the centre in a one-size-fits-all, uh, which is one of the things those within the NHS tell me is causing a lot of noise, causing a lot of disruption and actually getting in the way of them delivering patient care. But that adds up to quite a lot of jargon about basically saying you hope the service can run more efficiently and save some cash that way, but also dropping some targets. I don't think devolving targets. decision making well, but, is jargon. But, but I, I want to be really clear about, about dropping people. targets. So are you talking about dropping targets for care? What I'm saying is you have fewer targets at the, the centre and enabling people locally mm -hmm. uh, to look at the population, uh, be empowered, to have greater devolved decision making. I think £2.8 billion for your viewers, £2.8 mm -hmm. billion pounds, uh, being spent each year on the department on the arms length bodies is a huge cost and I think it's right at a time when mm -hmm. uh, your viewers are facing cost of living pressures that I, as the Secretary of State, are looking at how we deliver much better value for money and addressing some of the areas where they see waste. Of course, one of the biggest issues for the NHS and any employer is pay. Biggest employer in England, I think the NHS mm -hmm. is. Now, the Royal College of Nursing has done something very unusual. They've never done it before in their history. They have voted to strike, not just over pay, but also over the conditions in the health service, which they have significant worries about. Will you seriously negotiate with them? Well, I, my door is open and I have been meeting with them. I met the uh, General Secretary of UNIS and I met the RCN uh, as a, a, another union leaders uh, this week. Well, I saw the on. RCN Pat, Pat Cullen, the again RCN boss, last week. She says, my, must not let my members nor the public confuse these meetings for serious discussions on the issues of NHS pay and patient safety. She says they're not proper talks. Well, we have been talking to them. And as you say, it's not simply about pay. And on pay, we've accepted in full the independent pay review body's uh, recommendations. That's uh, a minimum of £1,400 increase for a, newly qualified nurse, for a newly qualified nurse. That's 5.5%. But what are you and of going course to do as a government comes, if well, nurses just, go on strike? Laura, let me just answer the last question. That's on top of last year giving 3% when the rest of the public sector were having pay freezes. So we have listened, we have respected in full the independent pay review body's recommendations where they look at these issues in the round. And of course, it's not just pay. If you mm. look at pension, a fifth of a nurse's salary goes but into their pension. But what are you going to do if nurses go on and strike? If ambulance workers go on strike, the GMB are balloting to 
you're responsible for the health system in this country. What are you going to do if they go on strike? Well, I think it's important we continue talking. That's why my door is open. Uh, it's not just, as you say, about pay. Uh, it's also about things like the estate. It's why we've got the commitment mm. to 40 new hospitals. We're investing in diagnostic centres, investing in surgical hubs. It's also about tech. One of the frustration staff often raised with me is around their frustrations with tech, which is a, a key area of priority. And we hugely value mm. the work that nurses do. Nurses and they don't have been feel through, valued. Well, and they don't feel valued. And also many of our viewers have heard politicians promise these 40 new hospitals before. There's quite a lot of scepticism about whether they're actually going to see them built before well, let, the let next election. Just, uh, just answer that then, mm -hmm. because so uh, I was in Liverpool this week, uh, the Royal Liverpool, which uh, has cost up mm -hmm. to 800 million pounds mm -hmm. and what the nurses mm -hmm. were telling me there mm -hmm. in that brand new hospital mm -hmm. is what a difference that has made and it's not just and that's, the Royal and that's one hospital it's not just the Royal and, we're, and we're short of time and we'll in, keep an eye on the 40 and, then it, and, and, we'll, and we'll keep an eye on the numbers that are actually being built in the next in the next few months where was the ambition and vision in the autumn statement this year we had the low the, the biggest drop on living standards in history revealed less money in future for public services not very much we've heard from the cbi boss about growth and how we get the economy going it's doom and gloom isn't it well we've protected the r d budget increase up to 20 billion pounds we've got 600 billion pounds of infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, we're seizing the opportunities of our greater freedom through Brexit. The Chancellor, well made, clear, well, the Chancellor made clear, for example, with Solvency mm -hmm. II and our financial services, that we will use those regulatory freedoms uh, much more. But could a closer relationship with the EU help? I mean, suggestions this morning that the government's interested in having a Swiss-style relationship. You used to be the Brexit no. secretary. Exactly. Is that on the cards? No. And, you know, so I certainly don't recognise uh, that uh, story. As Brexit Secretary, I worked hard to ensure we did get autonomy in terms of our money laws uh, and, and regulation. Uh, and one of the things we want to do on the regulatory side is particularly in the high growth areas. Mm -hmm. So the green industries, digital financial services within my own sector, life sciences, is use that regulatory autonomy in those high growth areas uh, as a massive opportunity. And I know you're an enthusiastic Brexiteer, but do you accept that up until now, there have been some pretty significant costs from Brexit, as well as the, the promise of future opportunities that you believe in? Well, there have been opportunities. I mean, people have talked frequently about the fact that I don't think we would have done the vaccine rollout mm -hmm. in the way we did had we still been a member but you uh, of the, the EU. But there's huge opportunities, and the autumn statement showed that on solvency too. We have large funds, but, uh, but do you accept there are costs? Pension though, funds. You've mentioned solvency too. There's already. always trade-offs. There's always some areas which are beneficial and some less so. But the point is, in those high-growth sectors, such as digital, life sciences, financial services, there's huge opportunities for the UK. And what we saw from the Chancellor in the autumn statement, particularly on Solvency 2, was the potential to use those very large funds, uh, pension funds, to then level and up and get those investing and we'll hear from in the, those parts of the country. It'll be interesting to hear what the CBI boss says if that, uh, he makes of what you've just said there. Just lastly, um, we heard from Justin Rowlatt a few minutes ago about the deal that's been struck at the COP climate summit. Um, do you think things have gone backwards since the UK led the deal in Glasgow? Well, I think the UK did a fantastic job uh, at Glasgow with Alex Sharma's uh, superb leadership uh, and the Prime Minister's uh, complete backing uh, of that. We need to look at the detail. Uh, obviously, that's just coming through now. Yeah. Uh, but the UK, through its overseas aid budget, has always supported uh, action in terms of climate change, and I'm sure we will continue to do so. OK, Steve Barley, th Barclay, thank you so much for coming in this morning. It's great to have you here in the studio. Now, we know how important and how difficult finding care for your elderly and vulnerable relatives can be, and we're going to keep talking about it on the programme. So please do share your experiences. You can email us at kunzberg at bbc.co.uk or if you're that way inclined, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura Kay on social media. Now, let's see what our panel thought about what the Secretary of State had to say. Um, Gary Smith, firstly to you. Um, you heard Steve Barclay there defending the government's decision, saying there is more money going in, uh, saying that the pay deals are, you know, are OK and he wants to talk to people. What did you think? Uh, I have to say I'm incandescent. I mean, this is deluded and frankly pretty dishonest stuff. Uh, from the Secretary of State. The ambulance service, the health service and care were on their knees going into the pandemic and things have got worse. And of course he finds it difficult to talk about wages. 
care workers are paid pennies above the minimum wage, doing an increasingly professionalised and demanding role. But times and he doesn't want to talk about pay and poverty pay. And if we don't deal with the crisis around staffing and health and social care, we're not going to deal with these but problems. But times are hard. You know, governments around the world, not just in this country, but governments around the world, have got a lot of pressure on money. And the NHS, unlike other bits of the public services, has had some extra cash. Uh, well, we could debate this at length. Why didn't they tax non-DOMs? Why didn't they tax the richest people in this country with the broadest shoulders who pay no tax at all? What have they done about bankers' bonuses? But the truth is, we made the Tory government has made ideological decisions over for over a decade about cutting services, and that's what's left our services on our knees. And this is not hyperbole or emotion. Our care homes were turned into morgues during the pandemic because we, of mismanagement and cuts. People are dying because of cuts in services. Uh, and so I find that interview, as I say, utterly dishonest. And frankly, I think the minister is deluded. Chloe, I know in your other life, aside from being a footballer, you're a, a lawyer and you deal with a lot of cases of people coming to you from the NHS when things have gone wrong. What did you make, make of listening to Steve Barclay? I think, I mean, I had the same concerns. Um, you know, for me, I see the kind of cases that we have rising. I deal with a number of uh, delay and diagnosis of cancer cases. And you see the impact that cuts, and especially with the pandemic as well, have had on the types of services that are being provided. And, you know, we see de delays, we see mismanagement, we see misdiagnoses. And this is not me blaming the NHS, this is me blaming the fact that there have been cuts, that it's underfunded, um, you know, that staff are put under immense amounts of pressure to deal with their jobs and, and growing caseloads. So for me, I kind of see the impact of that on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm dealing with clients, when I'm dealing mm -hmm. with their families, when you're dealing with NHS staff as well who are brought into those investigations and you have to read through some of these reports and, and what's happened is often tragic but often avoidable in, in a lot of circumstances. Tony, what did you pick out from what the Secretary of State was saying? Yeah, look, I think we all know that people are living longer and health and social care is going to need more and more money every year. And if we don't have an economy that's growing, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to pay for it. And Steve's right, if we don't have reform in the system, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to pay for it. And that's why I'm worried about putting off social care reform. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know that the NHS and social care interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Everybody sees that whenever they're trying to get a relative out of hospital into care. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we'll deal with the NHS now and we'll come back to social care in a couple of years, I don't think it works that way. We need to start reforming these systems now because we can't afford to keep up with the demands on the health system. And what about the growth in the economy then? So, you know, the huge moment last week, we talked about it a lot in the studio, but the autumn statement set out some pretty hard times. Yeah. All doom and gloom was very much the tone of it. You represent businesses in the country. What did, what did you make of it? I mean, what was, was there stuff missing? Yeah, look, I, look I'm going to give uh, Jeremy Hunt, who I thought did a good job with a bad hand, I'm going to give him a bit of slack. I, I like to think that this was part one of a part two autumn statement because part one was all about stability. It was all about fighting inflation and getting the government budget uh, in some decent shape. And that does need to be done. Mm -hmm. But there was really nothing there that tells us the economy is going to avoid another decade of low productivity and low growth. Growth. That's the worry. And Steve's right. Uh, Jeremy Hunt did some things which will be very welcome. Uh, but he also made businesses and everybody pay more taxes. And so the fear is there just wasn't enough there to turn around and say, we can grow again. We can afford the NHS. We can afford social care because we're growing again. So I don't think he did enough. I think he's going to have to come back with more on growth. But it was not so long ago when Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng put their mini budget forward and, and you said, ah, this is the new era of growth. You welcomed some elements of it and that turned into disaster. Yeah, but that's because of the elements we welcomed and the elements we didn't. What Kwasi and Liz tried to do was to shortcut growth. They said, listen, let's cut everybody's taxes. Everyone will have more money. We'll grow again. Well, that ended in disaster. But you, were, but you supported it. At because the time. what they said at the time was, we also need to do things that are unpalatable to, to Conservative Party politicians, right? We need to change regulation, change planning reform, have more immigration. And we've seen this morning, we may need to have a better relationship with the EU. That is the kind of agenda we're going to have to look at now. Actually, they were right about that, but they blew that case by trying to have this sugar rush of growth, mm -hmm. as Rishi calls it, and he's right, and that backfired. So, I don't like this debate where Liz Truss says we need to care about growth, but not inflation. And Jeremy Hunt on Thursday says we need to care about inflation, but we ain't got anything on growth. 
we need to do both. Otherwise, we won't come out of recession anytime soon. Well, I know you've got your conference this week with some senior politicians there, so it'll be interesting to hear you put them through their paces. But let's now talk about the World Cup. Now, let's hear from the FIFA president, uh, Gianni Infantino, who was speaking yesterday. Today I feel uh, gay. Today I feel disabled. Today I feel uh, a migrant worker because I know what it means to be discriminated. Chloe, listening to that, what went through your mind? Um, I had a lot of concerns about those comments that were being made. I think not only are they very offensive um, to the, the people that he's discussing there, but it, it minimalises the experiences that they've had. Um, and I think for him to, to open up the, you know, a very long speech with that kind of comment, I think completely detracts away from the issues in the tournament, which are huge. Um, you know, Infantino has you know, said some really controversial things there. And for me, I think the biggest concern is that he's completely missed the trick in discussing the issues. Um, so, yeah, I, I was just very appalled by those comments. You were appalled? Appalled, yeah. Um, disgusted. Is it right for the World Cup to be happening in Qatar at all? Or could it have been an opportunity actually to raise some of those issues? We, we know what they are, human rights um, problems in Qatar and also their attitude towards LG, LGBT people. I think, for me, I don't think that the tournament should have been held there at all. I think it was the wrong decision. I think it's the wrong location. I think it's thrown up, uh, you know, significant issues there. Like you said, the abuse of migrant workers, you know, the exploitation of migrant workers, workers coming over, not being paid at all, being abused, not being able to leave their countries, not being granted, you know, permits, being told they might be thrown in prison. And, you know, for me as a, you know, a member of the LGBTQ plus community as well, I have serious concerns about any fans who are LGBTQ plus fans who are thinking about going over to this tournament mm. because I think there's a fear there for their safety. I mean, you know, we've already seen um, Qatar have a massive U-turn in terms of the alcohol sales. What's to say yeah. that, you know, the initial messages they were having about, you know, Qatar being a very welcome, it's mm. going to, you know, not be a discriminatory place. Because they have said that everybody is welcome. But, but Gary, often the World Cup is a genuinely sort of unifying moment and it's a moment of joy for people around the world. But do you think this year, actually, maybe once the games start, it will, that, that the mood will change or not? Um, I, I agree with Chloe. I think it was the wrong decision. Uh, we support uh, an LGBT plus charity in football, uh, only a ball game. We've been, and we have actually raised concerns about Qatar's human rights and right, uh, 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 record on workers' rights for a long time because we import a huge amount of energy from Qatar mm -hmm. as well and we're increasingly in de uh, dependent on countries like Qatar. So there needs to be a, a debate about the World Cup but also things like energy and about where we're sourcing uh, our energy needs from. OK, with a Northern Irishman, a Scotsman and an English football player, I feel a bit, a bit <laughs> troubled about asking you who you're going to support. So I'll ask you instead, Chloe, what could the England men team learn from your friends in the English women's team? You're here. <laughs> oh, that's... Um, I mean, obviously, we've come off the back of a fantastic summer for, for women's football. I mean, you know, winning the, the, the Euros this tournament, uh, this summer... Uh, was absolutely huge in sort of, you know, galvanising the nation, you know, getting behind a, a fantastic win there. But I think, um, you know, the, the England men's team now going into this tournament, they're facing a lot of issues, obviously, behind the scenes with what's going on mm. with Qatar. It's not just the performance, but they've also got to grapple with these moral and ethical issues. And, you know, I know recently the, the men's team had just invited the migrant workers over for a training session, which was, was amazing. But for me, I'd like to see more, um, you know, these players using their platforms, I think, mm -hmm. to be able to speak out on these issues. I know Harry Kane is wearing the uh, the, the armband, armband, which is yeah. amazing. But and I have also just seen that, that FIFA have announced some guidance about, you know, the new armbands that they're going to be. Well, we'll, we'll see how they handle it in the in the coming weeks because the tricky dilemma is all over the place. Now, yeah. as we mentioned, the kickoff of the first match is today. And if you want to chew over a bit more of the dilemmas we've been discussing around the World Cup, you can listen to my old friends on Newscast on BBC Sounds. Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Adam Fleming and Chris Mason are there and in their latest episode they talk about what England and Wales fans can expect from the tournament this time round. Now, I've always promised you that we will have good news and I really meant it. So are you ready? We rise together back to the moon and beyond. The Artemis mission run by NASA wants to send men and women back to the moon and soon. A human being last walked on the moon in 1972. You can see them there. And after weather and some technical gremlins, the Artemis rocket finally launched this week.
and it is up there right now. These are the most recent pictures taken from the spaceship and we can show you, I hope, its exact location. This is where Artemis 1 is in space. That might not show you that much, but that shows it 59,000 miles away from the moon. And we've been talking to the NASA scientist, Howard Hugh. Now he's in charge of the Orion capsule. And if you forgive my technical explanation, that's the bit that sits on top of the rocket where one day the human crew will eventually strap in. So after years of work, how did it feel for him to watch the craft safely blast off? It was a uh, unbelievable feeling, uh, goosebumps, uh, but certainly, you know, uh, I would say uh, when I saw it lift off, uh, it was a dream. You know, it's the first step we're taking to long-term uh, ex deep space exploration for not just the United States, but for the world. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition and liftoff of Artemis One. And I think that this is, uh, you know, it's a historic day for NASA, but it's also a historic day for all the people that love human spaceflight uh, and, and deep space exploration. I mean, we are going back to the moon. We're working towards uh, a sustainable uh, uh, program. And this is the vehicle that will carry the people that will land us back on the moon again. And uh, I think this is one of the most uh, important moments, I think, as we think about uh, what the Apollo generation has done and now the Artemis generation. This is the first of three Artemis missions with that ultimate goal of getting people back there to a base on the moon. What are the next steps? How do you make it happen? Yeah, so I'd say this is not just three. We have multiple missions by which we are um, you know, planning for. Artemis 1 uh, is uncrewed. Artemis 2 will be our test flight with crew members. Uh, and Artemis 3 will be our first landing. And then we will have four, five, and six and we'll be utilizing uh, what we call the gateway. Uh, it will be an orbiting platform around the moon that we will uh, go to with Orion in the future and then get into a lander and go down to the surface. So it, it'll be a, a good uh, platform for us to, uh, maybe a rest stop if you want to call it that way, and uh, be able to get there and then get ready and then go down the moon and come back and then come home on Orion. So you're going to have a truck stop going around the moon? I do, <laughs> yeah if you want to think about it that way. What's it like for you when you see the data and the pictures come back from space? Do you watch like an anxious parent or are you so into the detail of the engineering that you don't feel like that? Wow, the analogy is great. Anxious parent, yeah. I just sent my daughter to college, so it's, it's kind of like uh, you're seeing your child and uh, uh, all the work that you've done you know, go off and, and certainly uh, anxious is a, is a good word, but also excitement and uh, seeing the success that you knew uh, were, was gonna be there and uh, being reflected back through pictures and uh, videos and through our data. How will we know if this mission's a success? So we really have uh, four primary objectives uh, on this mission. The first one is, we, one of the big things is, and I'll, I'll bring the model back, uh, is our heat shield. You know, uh, this, is, this is the capsule that will return crew uh, safely back to Earth. And the, the heat shield is, is, is a very important component to survive the re-entry environment, 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And so uh, to get to the, that kind of uh, temperature, you need uh, lunar return velocities. You need high velocity, 25,000 miles per hour. And so the only way to do it is to do an orbit like we're trying to do and give that return velocity so you can actually test and say, yes, the heat shield is, uh, as we designed, going to be able to provide this safe, uh, capability that the crew needs to return uh, to the surface of the Earth. So this is a, one of our primary objectives. Of course, our, our next objective is to check out the systems that have to operate in space. And uh, so we'll, we'll have uh, plenty of time in this 26-day mission to do that. Uh, the other thing is we'd like to capsule back. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> that's very important. You want to survive and return to capsule. Right now, there are no humans on board. You're testing the system. But anything else there? Anything in the crew module for the journey? Yeah, we have a mannequin, uh, Munikin Campos, who is sitting in the commander's seat. So we have one seat. And uh, so they, they're, where, uh, they're collecting data uh, for us. We also have a seat. So when we land, we uh, can determine uh, what we call uh, uh, the structural loads. I'll get in part on seat as the crew member, uh, when it hits the water, when it lands on the water, the crew member uh, obviously will feel some load on them, some, uh, from, 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 from the landing, and we want to be able to measure that. So we've got a, a Munikin. 
it's obvious talking to you how exciting the launch was and it was a success, but almost up to the last minute, there were still technical difficulties. Tell us about the red team of technicians who you sent in to make sure it actually happened. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I watched it. I'm, I'm not part of their ground team, so I was only like an uh, observer, I would say. You know, the red team went in. We had a leak on the uh, on one of the valves on the ground system, and they went and tightened it. You know, with all the technology, think about you still need a, a wrench and you need to torque torque a valve, and they were able to tighten it. But there was a huge amount of fuel on board, a dangerous situation exactly. at the last minute with guys going in with a wrench to tighten things up so it can get up in the air. Was it dangerous for them? They, uh, you know, I don't, I, I can't tell you too much details, but they're certainly fully trained, well trained. We would never put anybody in a, in a situation where it was dangerous. And when do you think there will be people living on the moon? You know, certainly in this decade, I mean, we're going to have people living now. The durations, you know, depending on how long we will be on the surface, you know, they'll be living, they'll have habitats, and they'll have rovers on the ground. That's what we're also working on at NASA. So not only are we able to uh, work in delivering people to the moon, getting people down in the surface of the moon, they still have to have an infrastructure. They have to have a habitat to live in. They have the fancy rover they're going to drive around. Uh, but ultimately what it is, is it's more than living. It's, it's really about science. You know, we're going to the South Pole because, you know, water, you know, the, the theory is there's ice and there's the, able to extract water. That's huge. You know, being able to convert that into uh, a potential uh, propul um, fuel uh, for our propulsion systems is going to be a, a, a very interesting scientific, but also just the geological aspects of it. You know, we, we did collect uh, lunar rocks and things like that, but if, if there are organisms that are embedded in that ice and things like that, could, could we be able to uh, discover something uh, new? So within this decade, you think there'll be people there? I, I, that's what we're going to be doing. You know, we're going to be sending people down to the surface and they're going to be living on that surface and doing science. And in the very long term, what are you hoping to achieve by putting people back on the moon? Where could that lead us? Moving forward is really to Mars. You know, that is a, a bigger stepping stone, a two year kind of journey, uh, potentially, depending on the orbit you take. And so it's, it's really going to be a, a very important for us to learn a little bit beyond our Earth's orbit. And then, and then do a big step uh, when we go uh, to Mars. There's some discussion that by putting people out in space, you could create environments where people are safely away from some of the worst ravages of climate change. Do you think space could ultimately provide safe habitat for human beings? What we're trying to do is, like I said, really provide the foundation. You know, you, it's the steps, the first steps you need to take. You need to build the transportation system. You need to be able to understand uh, what it takes to operate and live uh, in that kind of environment. And uh, these are the stepping stones that hopefully will allow this future capability that you're describing um, and give those opportunities and option uh, for our, our, uh, our kids and our grandkids and their, and their kids. One last thing, how on earth are you gonna choose the crew? It's a hot ticket, surely. I'm sure everybody's raising their hand in the astronaut office, and I'm glad I don't have to be uh, selecting or be part of that selection. It will be a tough call, certainly. Howard, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Howard Hugh from NASA there. And don't worry, not that we're obsessed with it or anything, we will be keeping an eye on the Artemis mission in the next few weeks. Now back to Earth with a bump. The Chancellor's statement on Thursday set the stage for tough times, tax rises and spending cuts. Last week on the show, we heard his opposite number, Rachel Reeves, say that Labour would be just as responsible with your cash, but wouldn't hike taxes on ordinary workers. How would they do that? Well, Jonathan Ashworth is Labour's Work and Pensions Shadow Minister, and he's here with us today and was also saying the National Space Centre is in Leicester. And of course, you're the M MP for Leicester South, so it's a nice plug for the National Space <laughs> Centre there too. Um, but talking about the health service, would Labour have given the NHS the full £7 billion it asked for? Well, let's look at the health service. Remember, as we went into the pandemic, waiting lists were at 4 million. They're now at 7 million. We've got 400,000 people waiting beyond a year for treatment. That's four and a half Wembley stadiums. The typical wait in the NHS has doubled from seven weeks to 14 weeks. That, that, that's not just misery for patients. That's having a direct impact on our economic performance as well. Can you answer that question? Would Labour have given the NHS the full £7 billion it asked for? Well, the NHS uh, 
does need investment, but it also needs staff, which is why what we have outlined is that we would get rid of that non-DOM tax relief and we would use the proceeds of that to recruit the doctors, the nurses, the clinical staff that our National Health Service needs. But that if you were in government right now, the NHS had said it needed £7 billion to cope with all sorts of costs, staffing, inflation, all sorts of things. Would Labour have given well, them the full amount? I mean, look at our history. We've always properly funded the National Health Service. And the last time we were in government, mm -hmm. we brought waiting lists down to their lowest on record and satisfaction with the NHS was at its highest. Now, what we would do if we were in government, we would take measures to grow our economy. And if you grow your economy, you have more, more money to invest but in are public you services. That, yes, you would have given the NHS well, the full Well, we're not in government pounds, today. And when we are in government, when we are in government, we'll make a full assessment of the needs of the NHS and fund it properly. But you've got to grow your economy. And one of the ways in which you grow your economy, particularly after 10 years or 12 years of this very poor economic performance under the Conservatives, is that we've got to invest in jobs and skills. So we'll create new jobs by green industrial investment in renewables and in hydrogen, but it will also help more people move into work. Because when we've got sickness rates mm. at two and a half million people forced out of work because of sickness, increasing numbers of over 50s leaving the labour market as well, I want to reform the system. I want to reform the way our job centres work to give people the support, the help, the retraining if necessary to move into work. And that will mean linking, linking up job centres with the NHS, actually, to help those who are out of work but, because but of sickness. But on a point of principle, if Labour wins the next election, would you spend more on the NHS than the Conservatives have been doing? Well, the NHS will always be protected under a Labour government. Well, that wasn't my question. No, 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 but, you're, but, you're, but, but you're, you're asking me to outline spending decisions for 2025, 2026, 2027, when we're in, when we're in 2022. So as we get Except closer to the... Nashworth. The government have given us the spending totals. Yeah, but the government have also years. given us, what, uh, four or five fiscal statements in the last six mm. months where everything has bounced around all over the shop. So we've got another two years to go. We'll have mm. more fiscal statements, mm -hmm. more budgets. But I can tell you in our manifesto, we will outline mm -hmm. our spending commitments and our taxation but commitments. And they will said, all be costed. We, what you have said, well, exactly what you have said is that everything will have to be costed. Yeah. Now, we've heard repeatedly from your colleague, Rachel Reeves, that everything has to be taken responsibly that she will have restraint and control on public yeah, services. Yeah, because we've seen because, what happens when you're irresponsible Because in her view, that's, that, that's the right thing to do. I mean, look at what they've done to and, mortgages. And, and Labour has yeah. accepted that there is a hole in the public finances, as the government suggests, of around £50 billion. Now, how would Labour no, fill no, that? No, no, What we're accepting is the OBR projections. Now, we have got a very clear fiscal framework. We will balance mm -hmm. uh, current spending and it will all be paid for mm -hmm. because that is the right responsible approach to the public finances. So paid for how? But we will have debt falling as a proportion of GDP. But we are prepared to invest. So we're going to invest in green industries, in renewables, in hydrogen to bring back good quality, skilled, unionised jobs across the country. Because that, that, that is important to bring people's bills down but it's also important for our future economic growth. But it growth. will also be very expensive. But I ask again, how would you fill the hole in the public finances that you accept exists? But, 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 but you see, my point is that we've got two years to go, haven't we? And in those two years, we'll have more fiscal statements and more budgets. So I'm not going to write Labour budgets for 2026 and 2027 uh, this morning. But in our next manifesto, every spending commitment we make will be fully costed and you'll see how we are going to manage the public finances. But, but we'll never be cavalier to... and reckless because that leads to people's mortgages going but up. But Labour is willing to sometimes tell us something. So you've told us, for example, you would do a windfall tax. You've told us, for example, that you would close the non-DOMS loophole. So you'd forgive people for wanting to know this morning. Tell us how you would fill that hole. One of the things that we would do is grow our economy. The reason why our public and finances... And everybody wants to grow the no, economy. No, 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 but the, yeah, but the Conservatives you're... haven't, though, have they? Well, They've given that's... us 12 years of weak but economic I'm asking performance. You, and I think our viewers do want well, to Well, know, let me give you an example. If you, were, if you were to win the election, how would you propose to fill well, the let, gap let me in give public you, Well, let me give you an example, yeah? If we could, my big ambition is to aim towards the highest employment rates in the G7. That means we need to give people support if they're if they are out of work because of sickness mm -hmm. or because they're an over 50 who's left the workplace because they may be caring for grandchildren and caring for a partner or a parent who might have dementia, we need to give this group of people more support and help to move back into work. So how all the government, well, how all the government announced is a review. I'm announcing action. So I'm going to better link the job centre with mental health services because the increasing burden of people leaving work is because of mental health. And where this has happened in the country 
in Manchester, where they've got a working well project. Similar, there was a similar pilot in Southampton. For every pound that was spent, £1.75 was returned. So it makes economic sense. So how many people of those who are not currently in work would you want to see going to Well, let me work? give you an example. The government have underspent by £2 billion on their own employment services. £2 billion investment over a five-year period ought to help a million extra people with job support. These are the sort of measures we should be taking to encourage people to, to increase the labour supply. And oh, by the way, increasing the labour supply is also a way in which you deal with the inflation so problems in the economy then, as well. Would, would you then promise that you'd get a million people who are currently not in work back into jobs? Well, at the moment, if the government used their underspend in their own employment schemes, that's how, many, that's how many people they would help. But, it dep but you know, the government have got to decide what they're going to do with that £2 billion underspend. They might be cutting employment support. But how it's many not of clear who are in the OBR budgets working, what they're cutting. But how many people who are not currently working would you try to get back into jobs? Well, we need to have. Well, at the moment, uh, it's gone up to £2.5 In 2019, there was about 2 million people out of work. There's also huge numbers of over 50s who've left the labour market as well who would go back. Now, a Conservative estimate suggests that there's 700,000 people who would return to work with the right support. Some have suggested it is as, one, as high as 1.5 million. Overall, when combined with our unemployment rate of 1.2 million, there's possibly 3 million people in this country looking for work but need the help with retraining, with, with the right sort of support, access support. That is what I am looking at, and that is, they are the reforms that I want to bring in to job centres. OK, Jonathan Ashworth, I'm sure in the coming months you'll come back in and talk to us again as you develop more detail on that plan, but thank you very much for now. Now, it is nearly 10 o'clock, it's flown by, and we know that the spending decisions announced this week by the Chancellor will have real consequences for everyone. We asked at the start of the programme this morning, how much is it really going to hurt? Well, the delay in fixing the social care system certainly will have real-world consequences. Here's what the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, had to say. These challenges are due to the pressure that we face from the pandemic. They're That's not why all about we've had to take the difficult decision. And it is a difficult decision. The Chancellor himself, when doing my job as Health Secretary, was very committed to these reforms. And that's why it has been a difficult decision to mm. delay. Just time for a final word with our panel. Tony Danker from the CBI, Gary Smith, the union boss from the GMB, and footballer and lawyer, Chloe Morgan. Let's talk about the rocket at the end. We've had a lot of doom and gloom in politics. You were all smiling while you were watching it. You can't make a face now, Tony. What did it oh, make you think? I love that guy. <laughs> I want him to be in my gang. I, I have a proposal, actually, based on this morning's show. I want to put Howard Hughes yes. together with Jeremy Hunt to design a plan for growth for Britain that takes us to the moon and back. There we go. <laughs> Slogans all over. Gary. I'd say Steve Barclay, I'll vote him on the rocket. While he's in orbit, we can sort out his mess in health and social care and get the wages sorted for our low paid members as well. Chloe, what did you think of Howard Hugh and the NASA project? I mean, how do I follow that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought it was amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, you know, we sort of learned about the, uh, you know, the previous uh, moon landing before, but to, to know that could happen again in my, in my lifetime, that would be unreal to see. And I am going to ask you all who you're supporting at the World Cup. I know we've got a Northern Irishman, a Scotsman and an English woman here, but I'm assuming you're supporting England? You'd be correct, yep. Gary? Oh, when I'm in a pub in Glasgow, I'll be supporting England just to upset the others. <laughs> <laughs> I support everyone with everything. <laughs> there you go. Ending with a very, very warm message to all the teams. I, of course, am supporting England and Wales throughout the tournament. No question about that. A huge thank you to all of you for being with us this morning and helping out during the last hour. We had Chloe's take on what to enjoy or not about the footballing spectacle in the next couple of weeks in Qatar. A dilemma there for many people, just as there are dilemmas at home. And we've heard what's normally quite a rare thing. A union boss and a business boss agree on something, that the government is re missing ingredients from its recipe for success. And the health secretary has admitted that a solution for one of the biggest problems that faces so many of us, care for the most vulnerable and elderly, that solution still has to wait. I might forgive you for feeling like moving to the moon after all. Don't forget, we love hearing from you and you can share your experiences by getting in touch anytime or catch up on anything you might have missed on the iPlayer whenever you like. But from me, goodbye for now. I'll see you next week, same time, same place. <laughs>